Kevin Colbert sure had a lot of interesting stuff to say yesterday, not least of which was basically declaring that Mason Rudolph will be the starting quarterback. I'm sure that's going to be everyone's headline out of that press conference. Not mine. Not mine. Good morning to you. Good Tuesday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Steelers. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into hockey and or baseball. I also offer up daily shots of Penguins and Pirates where you found this. Stefan Tuitt could, probably should, be back next season. And guess what? If Tuitt is back, then a lot of what I've been discussing here for a while as it relates to this team's glaring and top priority needs really changes way more so than identifying an individual who will play quarterback between Rudolph and Dwayne Haskins and somebody they bring in from the outside. That's not to say that it's more important than quarterback. It's certainly not to say that it'll be a hotter subject than quarterback. It's just that you're not going to see that much of a difference between any of the individuals the Steelers will have in that room. Whereas you could see a defense go from getting gashed, and I mean gashed, like with blood all over the field, like Minneapolis style, with Cam Hayward being asked to play three different positions with both safeties brought up to the line of scrimmage just so they can tackle. You could now see the restoration of what was, my goodness, just two years ago, the number one defensive front in football. Yeah, they'll be a little older, but we're still talking about Hayward to it, Tyson Alualu, who's already confirmed he'll be back. You've got to strike a deal of some kind to get Montrevious Adams back. I have no doubt they'll do that. Hasn't happened yet, though. You'll have Isaiah Loudermilk back. Anybody who was paying attention late in the season when he was thrust, and I mean thrust, into some pretty heavy duty, he came through. He came through, especially when it came to wrapping and tackling, and even to an extent with penetration. And if Chris Wormley, who'd been a starter, who'd been a mainstay, is put back into a situation where he's just a depth guy, This is a different team. It's a different defense for sure. Because it allows everyone to get back to where they belong on the football field. And then you add on top of that, having Brian Flores. And this is is way more significant than the quarterback issue. This portion of Daily Shot of Steelers is brought to you by Point Park University. Choose from nearly 100 career-focused programs leading to bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees. Choose when and how you'd prefer to do that studying, whether it's at Point Park's gorgeous downtown Pittsburgh campus, whether it's online. Maybe a flexible hybrid format would work best for you. Find out more about all of this at pointpark.edu. Look, I'm not about to suggest that the Steelers shouldn't be looking at Defensive linemen in the draft. Most of the guys that I just mentioned, certainly Cam and Tuit and Alualu, are up there. They're in their 30s. You need to start replacing them at some point. You need to start looking at that line the way you did back around the time that Cam was drafted and you started having to build up another wave after Casey Hampton and Aaron Smith and Brett Kiesel and those guys. That's going to have to be a priority in the draft, but it won't be one that comes with an immediate component, meaning you've got to get this player in the draft up high because you need him on the field right away. That's always a positive entering the draft. Any executive in any sport will tell you they hate entering a draft with specific highly specific positional needs because it handcuffs them and it influences them away 
from the tenant that's the best driver of the best drafts, and that is to take the best available player. Now, that said, the Steelers, of course, still will face such a challenge in this draft because they do have dire needs on the offensive line and at inside linebacker. Yes, inside linebacker in perpetuity. We will all be talking about waiting on Ryan Shazier's replacement with our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. But it's still better to have two of those types of needs than three. And it's okay to think big in this category. It really is. Steph changes everything by being back. And yeah, I'm going to repeat that it's, it's obvious that he and Tyson will be a year older, but neither of them had to go through a year of wear and tear other than, of course, Tyson's ankle injury. And both should be physically fit and fine, really, to be significant contributors again. We forget how good Steph was in particular. His 2020 might have been his best overall season, and I'm not just saying that because he was out there for every game, which in and of itself was extraordinary for him. He was a game wrecker. We gave a lot of credit that year to Bud Dupree opposite T.J. Watt and, of course, Cam for giving T.J. that extra room to operate because you could never double TJ. You could never even really chip TJ when you knew you had all these other people up front to worry about. But Steph was just a big ball of anarchy unto himself. And having him back sets that defensive line. It just does. And I shouldn't even say defensive line. It's defensive front, including the outside linebackers, I haven't mentioned Alex Highsmith yet, but I thought he acquitted himself pretty nicely this past season. And then it allows Minka and, if he's brought back, Terrell Edmonds to go back where they were, to go back into positions where Minka can make more plays on the football, be more of a freelancer than what he was afforded the opportunity this past season. You know what I'm talking about because you saw – both of them get shoved up there, kind of the way you saw with Troy Polamalu in his final season. And you're going, man, this is such a waste. But it happened again and again because they couldn't trust Devin Bush and Joe Schobert to make a tackle. They couldn't trust two of the three guys in front of them to make a tackle. Everything now kind of makes sense. And that could be a very, very good defense. And for anybody who would have in the past said, oh, yeah, but wait till Keith Butler and Mike Tomlin get a hold of them with it. Well, now you've got other people. You've got other people drawing up those schemes, and they are eminently, actually, over-qualified. When we come back, just one question. J1Q, and today's comes from Dan Brelman, who asks, chances that Juju is a stealer in 2022, why or why not? Who still asks why or why not at the end of a question? That's like school teacher stuff, Dan. Come on, man. Why or why not? Chances that Juju is a stealer, I would put myself at around 50-50. And here's why. Juju is going to be, yet again, disappointed when he goes into free agency. He's going to enjoy the romance of it. He's already done that. If you saw his public appearance in Dallas with Dak Prescott and everything, he's going to soak that up. And he's a name. He's a brand. That's to his credit. A, because he was a very good football player as a rookie. And B, because he's really, really good at the whole name slash brand thing. He's going to make some waves. The catch is... NFL executives don't really care about that stuff, and they sure shouldn't. They're going to look at his tape. They're going to look at what he did before he got hurt. They're going to look at what he did last season when he was nursing a knee injury that 
he really didn't talk about much. And they're going to wonder why he lost the explosive step that he had as a rookie when he was breaking off all those big touchdowns, even on just quick slant patterns. That went missing. It's not something that a lot of people talk about, but it's something that was plainly evident. So you're going to still look at Juju, again, if you're a GM or executive, within the context of being a slot receiver. You're not going to overpay a slot receiver. You're not going to give a slot receiver anywhere near the kind of money that Juju's looking for, much less the four-year term that he's looking for. So maybe there's a chance in there that the Steelers could bring him back on some kind of lesser term and lesser money as they did last year. Not so much as a prove-it thing, but just as a this-is-what-you're-worth thing. And we like having you, and you say that you like being around us. So let's work something out. Now, on the other hand, the circumstance is a little different from Juju's perspective as well. He said that his main reason for coming back to the Steelers was you know, that he loves Pittsburgh and whatever. I always, my default mode is to roll my eyes at that stuff. I'm sure that some guys mean it, and maybe he did to an extent. But he also talked about the value of being around the medical staff that he could trust with his full recovery. Well, I can't know how healthy or unhealthy he is, whether it's his shoulder or his knee or anything else on him. But I'd imagine that factor wouldn't be as dominant for him as it was last year. The other one is the obvious, which is quarterback. You can say, as a wide receiver, all the nice things you want about Mason Rudolph, and I'm sure we're going to hear that from Deontay Johnson and everybody else. Why? Because he's now your quarterback. You, you need him to feed you. you got to open the doors for that guy all over the complex. But... A wide receiver is going to want to go to where he can be the most certain that he can build up catches. And if there's something even in the back of Juju's mind that says, you know, I don't really trust Mason, then he'd also be shopping for a quarterback through free agency. The one thing you can take to the bank is that he's going to enjoy every minute of it. We're going to find out about all of it as it happens. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everyone listening to Daily Shot Steelers. We'll do this again tomorrow.